Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. And this made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Will he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I've found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time the money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local fire, uh, farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his field to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and he's now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields, working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of his servants, what was going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed a fattened calf. We're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. His father said to him, oh, dear son, You've always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found.
about this uh, time today because this teaching of Jesus is one of the most powerful and profound moments of his ministry on earth. And in a little bit, you're going to get to see some creative interpretations of this beautiful parable. But um, before we begin, I'm really thrilled because Dave has invited me to share a little overview, to give a little background about what's going on here so we can really capture the heart of what Jesus is teaching us. And I want to ask you all right now to just start praying for me because he's asked me to cover three stories in one chapter in five minutes. And so this is a great opportunity to see God do the impossible. Yes? So I need you to be praying. Um, one of the things I want us to focus on right away is in that passage that Galen read in the third verse of chapter 15 of Luke. You'll notice it says Jesus began to share with the Pharisees this parable. And if you realize or kind of pick up on that, that word parable is singular. It's not plural. And this is important because most of the time we will focus only on the prodigal son and we'll forget the other two stories. It's almost like we think there are three separate parables here when in reality it's one parable with three parts. It's kind of like singing one song with three verses. And so it's really important for us to take all three together because Jesus taught all three together in order to share with us this monumental truth. And I want us to focus on who it is he's talking to. Because at this moment, Jesus is speaking with the Pharisees, the, the pious religious leaders of the day, you know, who have who've done all that they can to make it themselves into the kingdom of God. And yet here Jesus is willingly welcoming the lowest of sinners to himself, and they are angry. They're mad. They're frustrated. And so what does Jesus do? He begins to share with them this one parable to teach them about the kingdom and the heart of God. Now, how he does this is amazing. He chooses to use three protagonists, kind of three heroes to this story. And these are people whom not only would the Pharisees not relate to, they would have been repulsed by. And so first he uses this shepherd. And if you know about the culture of the time, shepherds were considered dirty and despicable and unclean, somebody you would not associate with. And yet here, this shepherd is, being, is representing God himself. And we might be, be thinking, you know, what's the big deal with a shepherd losing one sheep? And yet for these shepherds, these sheep were their livelihood. They meant everything to them. And so, yes, they were going to go on a pursuit to find that sheep and bring it back. In fact, the shepherd would give up his own comfort and his own safety to go searching for that one sheep. Why? Because they were his most prized possession. He would not stop until they all had been restored to him. And then Jesus lifts up this woman. This woman, and I want to tell you, in the culture, women were considered lower than Gentiles. They were even considered lower than dogs sometimes. And to think about comparing the heart and character of God to a woman would have been unthinkable. And yet that's exactly who Jesus chooses to use. And we can be very tempted to sit there and think, you know, what's the importance of a woman who loses a coin? Why does that even matter? You know, I lose coins every day. What's the big deal that she lost one? But I want to share with you that at this time, the only money that a woman was allowed to take into her marriage and then take out of her marriage was this dowry. And because this woman only had 10 coins to start with, it kind of shows us she came from a poorer family. Now, what's amazing is for every woman, this money meant so much to them that they would often weave these coins into a beautiful headdress that they would wear every day. So for her to have lost one of these coins would have been devastating to her. 
And so she's going to go on a dramatic hunt to find this one coin. Why? Because it is her most treasured possession. It means everything to her. And so she will be relentless in her pursuit. The last person you're going to see lifted up is this reckless prodigal father and his two lost sons. What's amazing is that this father so loves his disobedient son that he lets him go. He ignores Jewish protocol. He doesn't have his son beaten or disinherited. He gives to him and allows him to choose. But it's not going to be until the part of the story where uh, this son has squandered everything he has, where he is living destitute with the pigs wanting to eat their slop, that the Pharisees who are listening would finally start to agree with Jesus. This is that moment you can almost hear that slow clap. Because they finally, they're like, yes, this is it. This is what's going to happen to all of you sinners out there. This is what you deserve. And yet Jesus is going to flip everything on its head because the story's not over. You see, this son chooses to return to his father. And when the father sees him, he gives up all dignity, all cultural expectation, and he takes off running robes held high to embrace his son and welcome him home. He was lost and now he's found. You see, this son was his most precious possession. He meant everything to him, and the party of the century was given. You see, that's the second big point in these three stories, is every time what was lost had been found, there was a celebration for the entire village. I want to tell you, Jesus is sharing this with us so we can know just how valuable we are to God, how far he'll go to find us and bring us home to him. I want to tell you this this morning. God so loves us, not because we are oh so valuable in ourselves, we are valuable because God so loves us. And I'm going to say it again. God does not love us because we are so valuable. We are so valuable because God loves us. And if you are lost today, I want to tell you God is relentless in his pursuit of you. And when you turn to him, he is running to you arms wide open. And he will be reckless in his celebration of you. To God, you are prized. You are his most treasured. You are his most precious possession. You are valuable. by definition means two very different things, like two sides of the same coin. First, prodigal means one who wastes. I have been that kind of prodigal. I have wasted. I've wasted time. I've wasted energy. I've wasted water. I've wasted money, mostly on shoes. <laughs> I have also wasted opportunities to help, to love, to grow, to forgive. I have been that kind of prodigal. I'm pretty sure we have all been that kind of prodigal. But prodigal doesn't just mean one who wastes. Prodigal also means one who gives abundantly, generously, lavishly. And I have been that kind of prodigal also. I have given abundantly to my children and to my husband. I have given generously to my friends and to my church. I have been that kind of prodigal too. I'm pretty sure we have all been that kind of prodigal too. We are all of us both kinds of prodigals, two sides of the same coin. Another interesting fact, God is also prodigal, but God is only one side of the coin because God never wastes, never misses an opportunity, never rests in his pursuit of our hearts 
never ceases to long for us to come to him, to follow him, to learn from him, to love him. God is lavish in his love and his mercy and his grace, his forgiveness, his provision, his presence. I mean, I could go on all day. God gives abundantly. God is prodigal. One last interesting fact. Tossing a coin is, by definition, a random process. In any individual coin toss, to coin toss, the chances of it coming up heads or tails is completely random. It can go either way. Life, however, is not random. Life is a series of choices and decisions and actions, which means that in any given situation, at any given time, we get to choose which prodigal we are, one who waits or one who gives. So the next time you are faced with that choice, what's it going to be? boy look at him look all coy and every girl thinking that she a toy man I can't stand that boy I mean have you heard this kid told his dad he'd like him if he rolled over dead and then took all his stuff and flaked like cornbread gosh I can't stand this kid oh if he were one sheep out of 99 you think I'd keep him over the others over his brothers? I wouldn't bother lifting a finger for a deadbeat, cheat, fleety feet repeat offender. I only hired the boy because I knew I could work him, break him, teach him what his dad ought to have taught him. He thinks he's a treasure. But if he were one coin in ten and I would have lost him, then I wouldn't bother the dust to go searching and trust of finding a coin I'd just as soon lose again. Dependable? Nah, all this boy does is flap his jaw. So I make him sleep on straw and feed the pigs raw trash. And you should see how the boy looks now. <laughs> Once headstrong, now broken. Once sang drinking songs, no longer outspoken. The pigs are pearls compared to this prince. They eat better than he. You should see the way he, that he looks at their sloth. The great prince, once filled with lust for luxury, greed for gold, and dreams of debauchery, now stares at the scraps of porky pigs, wishing it was his to enjoy. Mm -mm. But I heard him muttering the other day. Said something like, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But here hunger will make me dead. So I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Dad! I am a sinner against our Father and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your boy, so why don't you treat me like those you employ? So he left my service in search of forgiveness. And not that, really, if I'm honest. I think the boy just seems to pay back the hurt and debt with dirt and sweat. If I was his father, though, I wouldn't bother with this one. No, I'd bless another.
the older son saw his brother's betrayal. He heard his brother say to their father, give me my inheritance now. And he saw his dad's face lose its color and twist up in a knot as he tried to make sense of these words coming from his darling boy. He saw his brother's eagerness as his dad coldly counted out his inheritance like a grocery store cashier making change. And then he saw his brother stroll down the road, the money in his pocket and a smile on his face. The older son saw his brother's cold-hearted self-centeredness. The older son didn't see his brother after that. He didn't see him slink into brothels to pick up hookers, but he saw the sweat beating on his father's face as he worked twice as long and twice as hard. He didn't hear the catcalls and whistles from his brother as he gawked and ogled and threw away his shame. But he heard his mother sob and wail and pray to her God that she someday might see the boy she loved again. He couldn't watch as his brother's fun was abruptly cut short when the well dried up. But he had to watch his father endlessly pacing the floor as his field stopped yielding and the food in the pantry disappeared. He couldn't feel the sharp stab of pain in his brother's empty stomach, but he felt the guilt and despair and unrelenting angst of his parents as they continually wondered just what went wrong. The older son didn't see his brother hit bottom. And the older son didn't see his brother come back. He didn't see the poor and destitute and broken man hobbling down the road back to the place he once called home. He didn't hear the sudden gasp of recognition from a worried and aging father as he realized where he had seen that stranger before. He didn't see that dignified patriarch shamelessly kick off his shoes and sprint toward that ghost of a son he thought he lost. He didn't see his brother collapse before the one man who was excited to see him and the only person who cared if he lived or if he died. He didn't hear his brother's cry for mercy or see the tears streak down his filthy cheek. And he didn't see his father's tender, wrinkled hands running through the thick curls on the head of the prodigal who had caused him so much agony. The older son didn't see his brother come home. The older son just saw the party in the younger son's honor. He heard the music, and he saw the dancing, and he felt the anger and the outrage well up within him like a pot brought to boil. He saw his brother arrayed like Solomon and hailed as a hero, and he felt his face grow hot and his his glist fend. And the switch flipped within him. And he saw an old, bewildered man approach. And he heard from his own mouth an ungrateful voice spewing hatred and jealousy and arrogance and an acute sense of perceived misjustice. And he saw his father's face soften and his head shake back and forth and his leathery hand rise and rest on his shoulder. And then, the older son heard his father speak. My boy, you're always with me. My son, all I have is yours. But how could I not be happy? I lost your brother now I have him back. 
he was dead. And now, he's alive. up one day, felt so all alone, packed my bags and I turned off my phone, I said goodbye to places I've known, oh, I can't wait to leave my home. Another fight, a sarcastic tone, a sleepless night, and my, my resentment grows. Dad, your disappointment's all I've known. Ooh, I can't wait to leave my home. My son, you know. What I have is yours And all I've ever asked is That you do some chores And you try to keep God on the throne Oh, my sweet boy I want you in my home Daddy, I am a rolling stone and the dreams you have for me, well, they are not my own. You'd work my fingers to the bone. Oh, I can't wait to leave your home. So I'll follow him out to the 
to the bar, but I was on my own. Empty pockets and the girls moved on. Everything I had is gone. Oh, why did I leave my home? I didn't plan. This is all okay. No one can tell me what I'm supposed to do today. I worked for a then it's a back to my place. I think this can be mine. daddy's yard if I beg and plead and if I if I work real hard my home has not failed so far oh, I don't think I have a Too late. 
This kind of thing just isn't fair. My younger brother has acted so irresponsible while you act like you just don't care. Tell me what's the point of ever being good if both sinners and saints get your grace. I've ever only shown such great respect to you. Now you paid me back and laughed in my face. Father, I've lost all my love for you now. Must you treat me like a fool? Your sinful son receives the feast and fattened cow. This is a cut that feels cruel. this with us now. God loves the lost. How he loves them true. God loves the lost. How about you? Oh, how about you? Everybody sing how much you love think about the moment of that story of the father and son that I think is so powerful is not that the son is accepted when he comes back 
and has to be publicly shamed as the culture would require and has to earn back his position, but the father does something just undignified and not normal. He sets off running out to find the son. You get the sense in the story that he's been looking off on the horizon every day since his boy left, just hoping that he would come up over a hill and he would see him. And then he runs to him and I, I know we've talked about this before, but if you were the son, you would feel like he's running at me. He's going to kill me. He's going to beat me. He's going to hurt me. He's coming after me. And we view God that way, don't we? I've failed. I've sinned. I've let him down. He's disappointed in me. And here he comes to mete out justice and punishment. But the scriptures tell us that when our heart is sincere and we genuinely turn from our sins and come back to our God that he is just scandalously willing to forgive us and cleanse us and welcome us back home. And so if you go back to the beginning of this song, I want you to sing this with a belief and a desire that, God, I want to run into your arms. We're not just singing some song because it's fun, right, people? The target of this song is God himself shown to us in perfection through the person of his son, his one and only son, Jesus Christ. He was there at creation. He lived a perfect life. He suffered the cross and rose from the dead for us. And so when we sing to this, we're not singing some cheesy love song. We're singing to a God whose arms are where we find safety and where we find forgiveness and where we find reunion. And even though we are stuck on these darn stools, would you stand with me? sing out and oh I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love in prayer with me this morning. If you'd close your eyes and bow your heads. I just, as a pastor, as a minister of the gospel, I want to invite you this morning, if it's time to come back to the Lord. There's three people in that story. One of them is God, and that's really hard to relate to. But the other two, it's very easy. Are you like the younger son, and you've been away, and you've been sinning, and you've been full of pride or are you like the older son and you've been judging and sinning in that way and full of pride and I want to invite you right now if it's time to confess your sin and come back to the Lord to just right where you stand pray a simple prayer say God I want to come back to you 
I challenge you to admit today, if you have the heart and the spirit of the older brother who's always judging others and blaming others, to just lay that at the foot of the cross today and say, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that way. If you have the heart or the spirit of the younger son and you want to learn everything through sin and through mistake and you feel that something has been hidden or held out from you by God or by your family or something, and whether you've had that moment or not of brokenness and nothingness before God, I want to encourage you to come back to God this morning too and say, God, I'm sorry. I have been lost. I have been wandering and looking for love or fulfillment or fun somewhere else, and I'm coming back to you this morning. You are not a Christian because you are in this room or because you were born into the right family or even because you read a confession or prayed a prayer just right. You are a child of God and God is asking that every person humble themselves, bow their knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ to say, God, I know that I'm a sinner separated from you, and I believe in what Jesus did on the cross for me, and I accept what he did on the cross for me, and I believe that he died on that cross for my sins and rose from the grave to show his power. I want to say today, Jesus is Lord. And so if you want to say today that Jesus is Lord, would you just stick a hand up with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning? This is just for me on the stage. If you want to say today, I want to say for the first real time that Jesus is Lord. Would you just put a hand up in the air? Hopefully nobody's looking but me. There's one right in the middle. There's another one. Thank you. You can put them right back down, guys. Thank you so much. There's one back here, too. And 9 o'clock is largely our church and people that are a real faithful part of our church family, but I want to know if today's a day for you, church family, to say, I'm, I want to come back to Jesus in fullness of heart. I want to run into his arms. I want to remember what he made me for. Would you put a hand up in the air just to encourage your pastor on Father's Day even? If you just felt like God has moved and worked in your heart this morning, so many great hands going up. You can put them right back down once you've raised them, but thank you for blessing me and for and open before God.